Notwithstanding his views on blacks and women, Jefferson's ideas about education were considered radical. Virginia assemblymen scoffed at the notion of sending farmers to college. There is a snail-paced gait for the advance of new ideas. People have more feeling for canals and roads than for education. Jefferson continued to push for public schooling, even as he served as Secretary of State, Vice President, and finally as President. His final educational battle led to the creation of the state-supported University of Virginia. But his most powerful legacy was the argument that public education was essential to democracy. In the 1830s and 1840s, Jefferson's dream of statewide school systems began to take root, most notably in Massachusetts through the work of a reformer named Horace Mann. Agitate, 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 but nevertheless in a proper way and for a good cause only. In 1837, Mann found a system built on inequity. Schools varied widely from town to town. They were supported by local taxes and by fees charged to parents. Wealthy children could stay in school longer. The poorest couldn't afford to go at all. Rural district schools were out of shape and they were in disrepair. There were kids of all ages, from very, very young up to the age of the teacher. All the kids are doing different work at the same time, and the teacher had to be a kind of a ringmaster to keep all this activity going. School children spent hours sitting on hard benches, memorizing or reciting passages from books they brought from home, no matter how outdated or irrelevant. The teachers had no training, and they turned over very rapidly. The state took better care of its livestock, man concluded, than of its children in school. You crowd from 40 to 60 children into that ill-constructed shell of a building, there to sit in the most uncomfortable seats that could be contrived, expecting that with the occasional application of the birch, they will then come out educated for manhood or womanhood. Public schools had gotten very bad and people weren't supporting them. And many people were leaving public schools for private schools. And he wanted to uh, change the public schools, make them better, and make them so good that everyone would want to use them. So he was a great crusader for public education. He was the one who said government has to do it. From Cape Cod to the Berkshires, Mann held a series of public meetings to promote a new system of what he called common schools. They would teach a common body of knowledge that would give each student an equal chance in life. Education, beyond all other devices of human origin, is the equalizer of the conditions of men, the great balance wheel of the social machinery. That equalizing capacity of the school was something that he very much believed in, and he articulated more than anyone else the idea that the common school, and this new word for the district school, uh, became for him the place where we make Americans. This is the place where we all come together, elite and poor. That's what's common about it. Common schools would be free of charge so that poor children could attend. They would be of the highest quality to draw wealthier students away from private schools system would be entirely funded with tax dollars. Mann's plan was instantly and vigorously opposed. Critics of Horace Mann in Massachusetts tried to get him ousted. A lot of people said, we're not used to being taxed for schooling, we don't think it's a taxable issue, we think it's something that the users ought to be paying for, and we don't want you meddling in our local schools, which we think are fine. They didn't want state control. If you go back and read the history, and, and, and you know, go read Horace Mann's writings and so on, it impresses on you the precariousness 
of this basic idea that we take for granted, that all citizens have an obligation to reach into their wallet and pay for children to be educated, even if it's not their own children. Man was read and debated from New England to the Southwest, from Europe to South America. His ideas on school reform made him one of the most influential writers of his time. He got state bureaus of, of education. He got teacher training. At least he got more teacher regulation. He got um, free, most importantly, free tax-supported education for all the kids uh, in the northern states. Horace Mann is rightly the patron saint of public education. He talked about the public schools having this leveling effect that merit should be able to rise. There's a deep connection between Mann's vision and Jefferson's. Both of them disliked the idea of the family you were being born into determining uh, how you ended up in American life. In the United States, there is no nobility. Every citizen is equal in civil and political rights. The son of the poorest man in the country, if he attends to his learning, may become president. Even as the common school movement got underway, conflict arose over the question of religion. Growing numbers of immigrants were arriving from Europe. By 1840, nearly half of New York City residents were foreign-born. Many were Irish Catholics. They were generally poor and desperate for an education. Yet in New York, they found that the public schools, while free and open to all, were effectively Protestant. All the Protestant sects could feel very comfortable in American public schools. Uh, if you read Horace Mann, you'll see that his idea was we should have no sectarianism in the schools. We should all uh, read the same Bible. We should all say the same prayers. We should use those religious ideas that are common to all of us, meaning all of us Protestants. Irish Catholic children were being expected to attend schools where the King James Bible was read, where Protestant hymns were being sung, where prayers were being recited, but most importantly where textbooks and the entire slant of the teaching was very much anti-Irish and very much anti-Catholic. The Irish in general are brave and hospitable, but passionate, ignorant, vain, and superstitious. There are statements in public school textbooks in the time that would just astound you today. And that created a situation in which some 20,000 children were running the streets of New York without benefit of education because they refused to be part of a system biased against themselves. The Catholics have a right to think and worship in their own way, but have no right to claim one cent of the public money to propagate their own faith. One of the first principles of American freedom is to keep separate and distinct the institutions of church and state. Controversy over the use of the Protestant Bible in the public schools escalated nationwide. The Philadelphia Bible Riots of 1843 left 13 people dead. 